we are still talking about dimension. So, so I have said that um, if uh, X is a variety, then uh, the dimension of X is the maximum. Then we put the dimension of X to be the maximum of the dimensions of the XI where XI runs through the irreducible components. Now, um, we had uh, proven a few things. Now, we want to show that if we take the uh, intersection, so at the moment we are still working in a fine space, so called fine varieties. Most of the time we will soon uh, also deal with projective varieties. But uh, first we want to show that the dimension of intersection of an affine variety with a, uh, with a zero set of polynomial has dimension one less than the dimension of the variety. We have already seen this in the case of IN, that the zero set of a polynomial has in AN has dimension n minus one, and so this is the corresponding generalization. So proposition that X in or some and the variety of dimension n, so closed sub variety, so, uh, so a fine variety of dimension n, uh, let f be some polynomial. And we assume that it does not lie in the ideal of x if it lies in the uh, because then uh, if x intersected the zero set of f is non empty, uh, then the dimension of x is equal to n minus 1. So, first, clearly we have to make this assumption. Because if f lies in the ideal of x, obviously x intersected the zero set of f is x, and this has still dimension n. And uh, it can happen, obviously, that the zero set of the polynomial does not intersect our x, and then the dimension is not n minus 1. No, we would. Maybe the dimension of the empty set we one could call minus 1 or something, but anyway, it's certainly not n minus 1. And so, um, I know clearly you can have you know, a point, uh, and, uh, or you have two planes which don't intersect, in two, two lines in A2 which don't intersect, and so this can happen. And uh, also, according to what we wrote here, um, 
So we have to remember that this intersection, x intersected to 0 sort of f, does not need to be irreducible. So if it's reducible, so x intersected set f might be reducible. Um, and in that case, so then the proposition means so um, so if uh, so every irreducible component of uh, x in this, so maybe y i uh, of x intersected at f has dimension as at most n minus 1 and there is at least one which has dimension n minus 1. So this is what we prove here. Now later we will show that actually it's not like that. The actual statement is that without uh, that uh, the intersection of every, every irreducible component of x intersected uh, the zero set of f has dimension n minus 1. But in the moment we cannot prove that. We, we need to we first prove this. here and so every irreducible component of this intersection is a sub variety uh, not strictly a sub variety of x assume that our statement here is false, so assume that the dimension of this intersection is smaller or equal to n minus 2. And then we want to show that this y is here. So according to uh, so precisely the composition of this thing. Let's see. So we have this uh, so y after this uh, x intersected is zero set of f for f sum for long. So write um, f in the x the class of uh, of a number
So our aim will be to reduce in some way to the case that x is equal to a to the small n by using the Noether normalization theorem. But it's a, a little bit tough. But first we do the Noether normalization theorem. So let uh, pi from x to a n. We know it has dimension n, so it, the, the Noether normalization theorem will go to a n. So we, because we have, have found that a finite surjective morphism pre preserves the dimension. So and the Noether normalization theorem says that every uh, defined variety has a has a finite surjective morphism to sign some affine space. So that means its dimension is equal to this f. Uh, the finite surjective morphism. So as I said, by the Noether normalization. And um, as this map is surjective, we know um, so pi upper star from k x1 to xn to ax is injective by the exercise we solved and so we identify uh, kx1 to xn with its image in here So now we use that this map is finite. So it means every element in Ax is uh, the zero of a monic polynomial with coefficients here. And our candidate for this uh, thing is actually our class F. So this, uh, this polynomial F will satisfy a monic equation. So by Finiteness, and there exists a non zero polynomial. Say, modic polynomial H equal to x n plus one to the b plus sum i equal to 0 to minus 1 a i x i x i n plus 1 to the i uh, where the a i are some polynomials in x1 and x n okay it satisfies such that if I put f instead of x n plus 1 I get 0 Now, I claim we can assume that H is irreducible. So, if H is not irreducible, we decompose it into irreducible factors. If I put F into this polynomial I get zero. So for one at least one of the irreducible factors, if I put f into it, I do get zero. And you can also see that if you take an irreducible polynomial of a mon an irreducible component, you can easily check that if you take an irreducible component of a monic polynomial, 
that irreducible component is still monic. And so therefore, you know, we have this. Now we use, now we want to, uh, we use a somewhat strange trick. Let me see. So let phi. So I take the map, the first components, we use this map pi. This is just given by its, you know, here. Um, uh, and the last component is our f from x to a n plus 1. So we embed into one dimension higher. So remember that pi is a finite map. If I take phi composed with a projection to the first uh, n coordinates, this is pi. So we have a composition of two things which is finite, so the first map is finite. So as pi is equal to x1, the map given by x1 to xn composed with phi is finite. No, so that's how we get it here. Uh, also, phi is finite. Because if you have a composition of two morphisms which is finite, then the first one is finite. Um, and we see by definition if I take the image of X. This is contained in the zero set of uh, this polynomial H. You see? Because it says precisely if I take uh, uh, no, x1 to xn and you know, f of x1 to xn, this should be zero. And this is. Uh, no, if something lies in the image of this thing, then it lies in the zero of H, by definition of our H. Okay. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's a so <coughs> as uh, this is a finite map, the image is closed. And um, z of h is a zero set of the polynomial, so it has dimension n. Phi is a finite map, so phi of x has the same dimension as x. So both have the same dimension. So it follows if I have a closed subset of you know in you know, a closed sub variety of a variety of a certain dimension and they both have the same dimension, then they must be equal. You know, we had seen that if I have a strict closed subset, the dimension is a strict closed sub variety, the dimension is always small. So it follows uh, phi of x is equal to zero set of And now we have the usual thing. So the map phi from x to a n plus 1 is a finite morphism. So uh, then also, if I view it as a map to you know, the, and the image is closed, if I view it as a, as a map to the closed subset into which it maps, it's also finite. You know, because we have this inclusion, which we have used many times. So therefore, so thus also, um, if I take the map phi from x, 
to C of H. This is a finite surjective morphism. So it's finite because if I compose it with the inclusion into a n plus 1, then it's finite. And then the first map, if the composition is finite, the first map is finite. And it's subjective because it is there, just that it's subjective. And now you can just, <coughs> you can just look at it. So we want to see what is Z of F intersected with X. I claim this is the inverse image of the zero set of H and X to the N plus 1. So we have this phi, so the zero set of H, okay, this gives us X. If I take the inverse image of that, it gives us X. And uh, the, we see that the, if I, the, the last component of phi is just our F. So the, the inverse of the condition that Xn plus 1 is 0 is that F is 0. Okay, so we have this. But now, if you look at this, if here, in this <coughs> equation, we put xn plus 1 is equal to 0, we just get a0. So this is the same as p to the minus 1 of the uh, um, 0 set of a0 and xn plus 1. No? Because once, once I put xn plus 1 equal to 0, then my h just becomes a0. Which is just the same as p to the minus 1 of c of a0 times 0 in the last component. Okay. So, thus, um, you know, this p preserves dimension, so that means um, by our assumption, this z of a, so this thing has dimension n minus two, a uh, smaller equal to n minus two. So thus, the dimension of z of a zero. Now we are here, where in, uh, in uh, this is in the n. The dimension of C of A0 in AN is equal to N is more or equal to N minus 2. But you know, this is just we have a polynomial here in Kx1 to Xn, we take it zero set. And we know that if this polynomial is not constant, then the zero set has dimension at most, uh, has dimension at least N minus 1. So it follows that A0 is constant. Therefore, z of a zero is the empty set, and you know we have the inverse image of the empty set. Empty set so z of f intersected x is the empty set. Okay. So the details are a little bit tricky. How one precisely kind of makes it work, but so the very rough idea is that somehow you want to use the Newton normalization theorem to reduce it to the case of hypersurfaces in AN, but somehow you need this uh, additional strange trick to go into a fine space of one dimension higher, which uh, somehow confuses the issue, but somehow uh, I don't know how to do it otherwise, no? so somehow. But anyway, so, but anyway, the, the, the first idea is to use this Newton normalization theorem, and then you know, one has to think a little bit more. Do we assume that f is a 
No, it plays no role here if f is irreducible. But even if f is irreducible, it doesn't mean that intersection has to be irreducible. No, this, these things are not, uh, you, know, you could have something irreducible, you intersect it with something that has many components. But at any rate, we certainly don't make the assumption that f is irreducible. Okay, so this was this, uh, little, this was this proposition. And it's called proposition because we later prove something better, not because it's easy. Um, <clears throat> so now we have kind of, until now we have done everything with sub varieties of AN, all was about fine varieties. Now we want to also deal with projective varieties and maybe open subsets in a finite projective variety, so we somehow have to, uh, to get this from what we know for finite varieties. And this we, we do by proving that if you have a variety and an open, non-empty subset in the variety, then they have the same dimension. So then, you know, if you have an affine variety, it has the same dimension as a projective closure, or any open subset in, a, in an affine or projective variety has the same dimension as the corresponding closed thing. So, <coughs> now let me try to do this. This is another, in some sense, you know, there are different ways how you can define dimension. You could define it also via the transcendence degree of the function field, and this would be, this statement would be completely realistic. Uh, but uh, here, it isn't really, but it actually has to work. At x, your variety. And the u in x, the non empty open subset. Then the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of u. Okay. In some sense, yeah, you know, our intuition is that it means in how many directions it goes and so on, so therefore this is certainly true. But uh, let's see. So one direction is easy. Um, and you would, you know, in some sense u is smaller than x, so the dimension should, of u should be smaller equal to x, and this intuition is correct. So let u0 contain in one uh, and u be a chain in u. So these are all sub varieties of each other. So we put what does one do? We just take the closures and then they are chain in it. the easy direction, and now we have to look in the other direction. In some sense, it seems totally obvious how you would uh, 
do the converse direction. We just take a chain in X. You intersect every, every uh, XI here with U, and you get a chain in U. So what could be the problem with that argument? Could that? Yeah, well, it could be that uh, sometimes when you take one of these, small, these smaller XIs and dissect it with U, the intersection is empty. There's no reason why they have to intersect it. So we cannot uh, work quite as naively, but we somehow try to use this kind of argument, um, but then we need to go through several steps. So, so we first want to reduce to the case that x is a fine. But I, that's what we want, but let me first do it simpler. So let's say, let, uh, so obviously, if we have such a chain, we can, so this is a sub variety, we can take it as a sub variety of dimension zero, if it's the, the, the smallest one, so we can take it a point. So it's some point in X. If we assume that U contains this point, then the argument I just sketched works. So let W in X be an open affine subset I'm wondering whether I... Did I actually prove that? That every uh, variety has an open cover by a fine variety? Um, I think you mentioned it. But I mentioned it. Well, anyway, so I will maybe then prove it next time because we're using it. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, so I just state here, so every variety has an open cover. The fine varieties. Where uh, a fine variety means that it's isomorphic to uh, a sub variety of some affine space. So let this be an open affine sub variety. Uh, with such that this, I mean, of course, point, this point P with P in W. So assume, so it has a cover like this, so we find some such thing. I have a question regarding the argument you mentioned. Even if, uh, even if they, all of them intersect uh, you. Why can't it happen that after intersection they collapse? So they become the same thing. Well, that we will see now, I think, because in this now we have to make that argument. Okay. <laughs> you know? Okay. So we put as a, you asked, you put wi equal to xi intersected with w for all i. And now the point is that um, so we know that w i plus 1 for given i is uh, not empty, 
So it's a non-empty open subset of xi plus 1. So that's w i plus 1 is a non-empty, this is the same argument we already used. So you get it's a non-empty non open subset of xi plus 1. So it is dense in x i plus 1. Whereas uh, wi is contained in x i, so it is not dense. In x i plus 1. So therefore, we have strict inclusion. So thus, for all i, wi is strictly contained in wi plus one. Okay. So this is. Uh, so we we needed to answer precisely the question that you uh, that you made. So therefore, we have a chain in uh, this thing. So we have w zero which is still our system point, uh, contained in W1. Wn is a chain in W. So we get the dimension of W is equal to the dimension. I mean, if I all right, it follows it's bigger equal to the dimension of x. But we already know w is an open subset of x, so the dimension is equal. So at least there are some open subsets which have the same dimension. And in fact, they are can be chosen as a fine open subset. Uh, yeah, you have to do the things. So with this, so replacing x by w and u by u intersect w, we can assume that x is a prime. So why is that? So we know, so we know that the dimension of u is bigger equal to the dimension of u intersect at w because this is an open subset and we have shown that. And so if the dimension of uh, uh, w is bigger equal to the dimension of uh, so is say small equal dimension of u intersected w then it follows that we have all to be equal to the forest which is a <coughs> and uh, which is equal to the dimension of x then it follows that the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of x. So we only we can reduce ourselves to the case that x is fine. Now if it's fine, it means it's isomorphic to a subvariety of the n. So we can assume by using an isomorphism which preserves the dimension because it preserves the chains of, of all closed subvarieties. Um, we can therefore assume that x is a closed subvariety of some AF. Canton can see by saying that because in any non empty open set in a variety is not contained in any 
other closed uh, set except the Uzbek itself. Therefore, the dimension should be uh, the same because otherwise we should get a closed subset in between. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit subtle, no? I mean, because the dimension just decreases every time we have a closed subset, right? So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, but you know, it could be that if we make the thing smaller, that there you find somehow more, I mean, there would be more possibilities to squeeze things in between. I don't know. It's not, I mean, obviously the statement is true, there might be more than one proof, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's trivial. I mean, somehow you have to, you know, it could just be, you know, you see, uh, if you have a chain in X, it could just happen that all the, the elements in the chain all lie outside of you. I mean, or some of them lie, don't lie, don't intersect you. So, if it somehow would be the case that somehow the, this chain was in some sense unique, then, you know, the dimension would have to be smaller. But somehow, this seems to indicate that these chains are not so unique, so you, you can uh, move them somehow. Okay. So, so thus we can assume. So, we can assume that X in AM is a closed uh, sum A is a closed sub A. So, we again, uh, so we first deal with the case that X is actually a fine space. So, if X is just a n. Then we can say see that the statement works. Um, namely, so let x zero be a point in X. And uh, uh, so, x to n and u, uh, so u in the n is open. So let uh, x0 be a point in u. Then we can just take linear subspaces passing through this point. No, just a zero set of linear polynomials which pass through the state. So um, let xi be, so let's say for all i, let uh, xi plus 1 be a fine linear space. Uh, the point P. So just the point can be written as no x1 minus. So this point is a1 to n, it's a zero set of x1 minus a1 until xn minus a n, and then we just take, you know, we move one of these equations at a time. Um, so then we can put ui equal to xi intersected with u, and uh, then we can, this gives us a chain. So u0 contained in u1 is a chain. In, basically, we have the same situation as before, that the smallest point is contained. So. Uh, Thus, the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of x. Okay. So then finally, we deal with the general case, so x is a closed subvariety of a n.
n. And then I think we will again want to use the, I mean, for some a n. And we again use the, uh, no, and we assume that the dimension of x is equal to n. We have to just use this all. Um, and so we use again the Newton normalization theorem. So, so there is a, a finite subjective morphism. Uh, P from X to A. If you want to use this to somehow transport, show that the dimension of uh, an open subset of X is the same as the, the you know, we want to somehow compare it here by looking at the image. So, so phi. So you know, remember that u in x is open. So phi, so x minus u is a closed, a proper closed subset of x. So it follows, because it's a finite so morphism, that phi of x minus u is a proper closed subset of the yeah. end. No, because we had seen that if you have a, at least we had seen that if you have an ir, no, if you have an irreducible subset, then which is strictly contained, then the irreducible component is strictly contained. And obviously, if it is the union of its irreducible components, and so this will be. A proper closed subset, not equal to a. So the complement is open. So, which I call Z. So let's F, maybe I write large, F be a polynomial which lies in the idea of Z, which vanishes on this thing. And we put V to be the zero set of F in A. No, obviously not. We put V equal to A N minus the zero set of F. We want it to be an open set. This is an non-empty open subset. And so we know when it's that the dimension of V is N. And let um, W be the inverse image of V in X. So, phi uh, from x to the n is subjective and closed. So it follows also that if I take phi, so thus it follows that if I restrict phi both in the image and in the target, so here in the image to this and in the target to the inverse image of that, um, then, so, okay, in the target to V and in the, in, in, in the source to the inverse image, then it's still subjective and closed. No? Because we have just, no, uh, no, because we have to induce the quality. So, um, first slide, and maybe let's see it again. And it follows. That phi from W to V, so phi restricted to W, is subjective and closed. So first, it's clearly subjective because I have, you know, uh, it was subjective before, and then I have 
restricted here to the inverse image of V, so it will certainly be subjective. And secondly, it is closed, because if I have a closed subset here, the image of the closed subset in V will be the intersection of V with the image of the closure of that closed subset. So it's a closed subset. It's just a, okay, it's subjective and closed. So it follows that the dimension of W is bigger equal to the dimension of V. But now, clearly, let me see, but by definition, uh, we have that W is contained in U. Because here we have taken you know, the, <coughs> the, uh, the complement of an element in the ideal of Z. Uh, so this means all the elements here have the property that uh, you know, that we are, so, so if you just look at the definition, uh, the way I've given here, it is clear that W is contained in U. Because F will vanish on the whole of Z, so the, uh, the, the zero set of F will actually be bigger than Z, and so that makes the complement smaller. So it does the dimension of W is smaller than the dimension of U. But we had seen that this and dimension of W is bigger equal to the dimension to the dimension of X to the dimension of U. is bigger equal to the dimension of this. Okay, so this was a somewhat complicated story. But I mean, in some sense, what one maybe can remember is that in some sense, uh, what one just wants to say is that the first idea is that if you have a chain in X, and you have U and open subsets, you just intersect with the chain, and you get a chain in U, and it doesn't quite work, and then you have to use a little bit of, uh, kind of reduce to the easy case. But the, the, the main idea is that it should work like this, and if, if you I mean, kind of push it a little bit, you can uh, make, it, make it work. So you can restrict to the, the case of the fine varieties where this actually is true, and then if you're not in this case, you have to do this, uh, some, you know, you have have torture it a little bit until it works. <clears throat> okay, but I mean the basic idea is just that. Okay, so that was that. Um, now, uh, this actually is um, surprisingly. Uh, let's see where my page is. But it's not the page. Yeah. So now. <clears throat> The next thing that we want to prove is uh, the stronger version of the result we proved first, that if we have uh, a fine variety and a polynomial, uh, then this, every irreducible component of the uh, intersection of the variety with the zero set has dimension one less than this variety. And uh, there's maybe first I want to review something that I should have said earlier, but uh, not in the same vein as uh, uh, this thing that they find cover. It actually plays a role in proving later that, they, that every variety has an open defined cover. So I just want to recall, I already used it, but I want to once write it on the blackboard. So the variety x is called Fine uh, if X is isomorphic uh, 
to a closed subvariety, to an irreducible closed subset of uh, some affine space. And one thing that one needs is that if you have uh, a subvariety of a fine space, and you take the complement of the zero set of a polynomial, this is still a fine. So, lemma. Let x in the end be close subvariety. such that uh, say well that really needs but I mean to say that x uh, and if I say x is not contained in the zero set f then we call I need to first make this an action condition. See, we call um, xf equal to x minus the zero set of f. Maybe a basic open subset. certain open subset and now the claim is that xf is uh, defined so <coughs> lemma so the same assumption so x in the end find right in a polynomial which does not vanish on x, which is the same statement we said, <coughs> uh, then xf is defined. This is actually quite simple, but you know, I should have shown four. So I have to show it's isomorphic to some subvariety of some affine space. And we actually find it's isomorphic to a subvariety of affine space one bigger. So um, we put uh, Z to be the zero set of say the zero of X. Now in the first n variables, and one more polynomial, which is uh, f mark times x n plus one minus one. So something very similar to what we have encountered in the proof of the Nullstellsatz. So we take the zero set in a n plus one. So the first these polynomials here depend only on the first n variables. This one uh, depends. Also on n plus 1, and this obviously is f of x1 to xn times this. Okay. So then we can, can find a morphism from x, f to this thing. So that t, which is given coordinate wise by x1 to xn, which means it's identity on the first coordinates. And then I take 1 over, say, the class of f in the coordinate ring from x to z. So if I write this, let me first write like this. So this is xf. Like this. So first it goes to obviously to the n plus 1. We have a n plus 1 from 4 coordinates. Um, so, why is this a morphism? So, these are just the coordinate functions, they are certainly regular functions. Uh, on, on xf, we have that f is not zero. 
So this is a rational function without a pole on xf, so it's a regular function. So this defines a morphism to an plus 1, and we can see, so this is as a 1 of as f as no 0 on xf, we have that phi is a morphism. And um, it's easy, we can see immediately that the image of this map, phi of xf, is equal to z. No, because it's just, uh, I mean, you know, by, by definition, so the first, on the first coordinates anyway, the identity, and then, so, uh, and this map is precisely done in such a way that the last coordinate is one over the other one, so this is, uh, uh, and you also see the map is bijective. And clearly, the inverse map is just a projection to the first end coordinate. So phi to the minus 1 is just x1, xn from z. So first to a n, but then goes to, obviously, to a x. And so this is an ice cream. First, if, what? if um, x in Kn is quasi projective, then x is equal to uh, the union i equals 0 to n, x intersected with ui, where these are these. Uh, open sets where the i coordinate is non zero and uh, uh, x intersected ui is isomorphic to this isomorphic. So, uh, well, a locally closed subset of an. So, uh, what I write like. X itself doesn't have to be is locally closed so in a section of an open and closed subset. And if I intersect this with u i, it's an intersection of an open and closed subset with u i, which by isomorphism is uh, a locally closed subset of a. So thus we can assume, and then if we find an open cover by, uh, it finds for each of these 
pieces, we can just take the union of those and get an open cover for x. So thus we can assume. x in a n is totally closed. So that means um, Sorry, how can how can we assume that x is embedded in one space? So it's isomorphic. So x is the union of these things. Mm -hmm. So if we prove for each of these pieces mm -hmm. that it has an open cover by a fine varieties, we are done. Because we just take all of them. But this thing is isomorphic to the image inside the end of this. So therefore we can replace x by this and then by its image. So that's a locally closed subspace in the end. No? I mean x intersect with ui is isomorphic to which we really want to score pi or ui um, of x intersecting with ui in the n. And you know, this is a homeomorphism. This was locally closed in this, so this is locally closed here. So we can assume this locally closed in the end. So it's an intersection of an open and a closed subset. So we can say that x is equal to x bar intersected uh, mm, say x so x bar minus the zero set of some polynomials. of a closed sub variety with an open thing, the open thing is that, and the closed, uh, so an open thing is a complement of something closed, which is a zero set of some polynomials. So, which, so that means x is this, this is the union from i equal to 1 to l, X without zero set of alpha. No? This is just the common zero set. Of and so this, and we know that if I take an, a fine variety and take away the zero set of something, this is a fine. So this is an open cover variety. Okay. As a matter of fact, I mean, this thing. It's really quite important if one goes on. Also, if one generalizes to scheme theory, that's more or less how one defines schemes. Something which locally uh, has, which has an open cover by something which one then calls a fine scheme, which is generalization of this. Uh, and the whole theory is built on this. So you want to can always reduce your arguments to a local argument. So by an open cover, and then you only have to be able to deal with the fine varieties. You know, it's like uh, you know, like doing differential geometry. No? These uh, fine charts are like the charts you have in differential geometry. Only they are a bit more complicated. It's not just every chart is just uh, R to the n. You know, all the fine varieties occur as open charts. But you know. Um, okay, so that was this, and now I want to show that every irreducible component, uh, yeah, that this generalization is before every irreducible component of the uh, intersection of uh, uh, in a fine variety with a hypersurface has dimension one less than the right. So here uh, that uh, x in and in a fine variety and 
entre f y polinomial maybe I just get it in here x1 to xn which does not lie which does not vanish on x then it follows that every irreducible component of um, x intersected this function of f has dimension and the dimension of x minus 1. Now, as at first, at the first look, that would seem unlikely to be true because we had uh, before the statement in order that the dimension of the intersection was uh, uh, the dimension of x minus 1, we had also the condition that uh, this intersection was not empty. And here we have no such condition. But if you think of the logic, that's not a contradiction, because if the intersection is empty, then the intersection has no irreducible components, and we are not asking for anything. So all the irreducible components, which are precisely none, have dimension x minus 1. So this is OK. So if uh, x is second at f is empty, this, this is not excluded by the theorem. We have, it just means no irreducible components. And therefore, the statement, you know, nothing is clear. OK? So now let's prove it. It's actually, uh, now it's quite simple. So we just take, uh, you know, because we can just, we can replace x by an open subset. And this open subset, we, you know, we pay attention to one irreducible component that the open subset we consider is what we get if we throw away all other irreducible components. And then the statement we had before uh, reduces to this. So as you see, so let z be an irreducible component of um, x intersected with f. And we put w to be the union of all the other irreducible components. So then you take in a fine variety. No, I was shown. And uh, if I take u intersected g of f, this is just u intersected to this z. And maybe one thing. You should see that even, so we know that 
u is in the fine variety, it means it's isomorphic to the sub variety of a n plus 1. No? But the, the first coordinates are just x1 to xn from x. So it's still, u, we still take this, zeros, this intersection, u intersected zf. So you remember, u is isomorphic to you know, u tilde in an plus 1, via a map which is the identity of the first n coordinates. So it means that uh, u tilde intersected, so u intersected, so how shall I put it? Um, so, let me call this phi. So if I take phi of u intersects at f, this is just u tilde intersected z. Where f is now a polynomial, so there are n plus 1 uh, variables, but as a polynomial in the first n variables. This is, if you look back to how we have defined this, this is just what it is. So it's still the zero set of a polynomial. So this has dimension n minus 1. So by uh, uh, so by previous proposition, u has dimension and dimension of x minus 1. And uh, you know, u is dense in, in, and so thus also Z is dimension. Yeah, dimension of X. Okay, so this proves the state. So this uh, now becomes a quite trivial corollary if you know all these other things. But by itself, it's a much more important, you know, it's much more useful to know this than just to know that you know, all the elementary components have dimension at most n minus 1, and there must be one which has to mention n minus 1. This is much more useful. We will now see what we can do with these things. So, <clears throat> so first we want to prove, uh, do I have the time? Yeah, I think I might still be able. So basically, these are all the technical results. Now one can kind of uh, do things with them. So the first thing that I want to prove, I think the last one I will be able to prove, uh, is um, uh, that dimension is nicely additive in more physics. So let f from x to y be morphism of varieties. Assume there is a non empty open subset uh, say u in y uh, such that the dimension of the fiber, so f to the minus one of p is equal to n for all p in u. So we don't need that all the fibers have dimension n, but there is an, an open subset over which the fibers have all dimension n. Then it follows that the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of y plus n. So this also means it cannot happen that there is some fibers here which are so big that it makes the dimension of x uh, you know, bigger than that of y. Somehow, the fact that this is a variety uh, means that the you know, dimensions cannot jump so much. I mean, so we have this. And this is uh, <coughs> now I want to prove it. <coughs> and you will prove it by induction over the, well, first, 
this thing, so here we have this thing that we have this non-empty open subset. But uh, obviously we can just replace y by this non-empty open subset and x by its inverse image, which is also an open subset. And then all the fibers have the same dimension. So, so, so if I take, so, so B equal to, uh, what was it? F to the minus one of U is open and dense non-empty in x, and so the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of v, the dimension of uh, uh, y is equal to the dimension of u. So we can replace x by v and y by u. And so it's enough to show the, it, it, our result under the assumption that all fibers have dimension. So, so we can, uh, can replace x by v, u by y, or maybe y by u, and thus assume all fibers f to the minus dimension. Okay, that's the first reduction. Now we want to prove the, re the result by induction on F, on Y, on the dimension of Y. simple and there are some details. So obviously if the dimension of y is equal to zero then y is a point and x is this fiber which has dimension n and the statement is trivially true. Um, and otherwise you would somehow want to say that you know you you want to you have y and x so you take uh, you know you can assume that y is a fine you take a uh, you take the zero set of a polynomial, which has dimension one less, and the inverse image you can show is can also be taken as the as zero set of polynomials where dimension is also one less, and so by induction and this result follows. So let's try to do it. So the maximum one. So if dimension of y is zero, then y is a point. And this thing is trivial. This is because y is just the fiber which has dimension n. Uh, so we have to do the induction step. So replacing y uh, by an affine open subset. And uh, x by an fine open subset of, um, or just uh, of uh, f to the minus one of this uh, of u, we can assume. x and y are defined. Okay, so now we can assume x and y is defined. And in fact, we can assume the variance sum. So x is a closed subvariety of some AL and y is a closed subvariety of some AL. Of course, we can use an isomorphism. Okay. Uh -huh. 
So let uh, f, so this was an a m, can be now given coordinates twice by some polynomial. So this is f1 to f m. So the f i is some polynomials. Okay, x1 to x. So this is how such morphisms are given. So let g. Um, here for normal k x1 uh, maybe I call these coordinates y on the, so the coordinates on the uh, here I call y and the coordinates here I call x huh? g in the polynomial uh, such that so the zero set of G intersected with Y is not empty and it's also not equal to Y. No? So that the, our theorem applies. So let Y prime be an irreducible component. Of uh, y intersected zero set of g, then by our theorem we have that the dimension of y prime is equal to the dimension of y minus one. So let x prime be the inverse image. So, so first, the, we see that um, so f to the minus 1 of y intersected dg is just equal to, no, this map is given by this f1 pair of m, so it just means the fi map this to this uh, to the zero set of G, so it's just the zero set of G of F1 to Fm intersected with X. No, because it's just see, the Fi coordinate, which so the, the i coordinate on the in Y is just the Im, is the image of the Fi polynomial, so it's just this. So thus x prime is the union of irreducible components. Of the zero set of G of F1 to Fm intersect with X. Because we know that if you have a morphism, it maps irreducible components into irreducible components. So, you know, this thing obviously uh, so it follows that the dimension of x prime is equal to the dimension of x minus y, because it's a zero set of the polynomial. And so, thus we see that the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of x prime. Plus one, which is equal because by induction it applies to x prime to the dimension of y plus this m plus one, which is equal uh, y prime, which is equal to the dimension y plus one. So that proves. Okay, so. Um, that was all I wanted to say today. Uh, next time we'll give a few more applications and then
but all the, the difficult parts are somehow done. This was uh, maybe a bit more technical, but you know, part of it is that we really wanted to be able to apply everything we had done. You know, so it kind of locally everything we have done looks maybe not so subtle and so difficult, but if you put it together very carefully, then you can actually do some things, but then it also is not so completely straightforward to follow. Okay.